Hi, everyone. We're going to start talking about the history part, which sometimes is the boring part, but the part that we really, really need to get through so that you understand how we got to here. So let's start a little bit back. Between the 1600s and the 1800s, at least that's what the recorded knowledge is. I know it starts before that, but from the 1600s to the 1800s, First Nations people in Canada were pretty much uh, helpful to the new settlers coming in. Uh, they wouldn't have made it in Canada without us because they needed to learn about things like using cedar tea to get uh, vitamin D, which stops scurvy. So there's a lot of things that happened in that time frame, but really there's allies. And uh, when the settlers needed more land, the First Nations kind of moved away a bit, uh, or at least, a, you know, they didn't want to be near them. They felt like they lived a whole different lifestyle. They had these permanent homes, which First Nations at that point didn't have. And so they start to separate, but they're still allies. Well, the other thing I want to call your attention to, and a lesser known fact for most people, is that the Iroquois Confederacy actually helps to write the American Constitution. That we the people part, uh, and that first probably article that's written there, comes from the Iroquois Confederacy's con uh, constitution. We the people, for the people, by the people. That's all part of the Iroquois Confederacy's constitution. And uh, the makers of the U.S. Constitution liked it so much that they kept it. So when we hear that uh, the American settlers were not happy with First Nations, that's true because they were trying to move them. That's a whole other course. That's a whole other lecture. But just to know that we did have our own laws, we knew how to govern ourselves, uh, we had things in place in order to, you know, penalize people if they committed a crime, uh, we knew how to take over our territories and look after them, environmental stewardship, if you will, and we had things like the two-row wampum, which if you're at Wakabanes, you'll see we've been gifted one there. And these were meant for uh, treaties between different First Nations communities. So there's those, there's many, many others, the Silver Chain Covenant, the Dish With One Spoon. Uh, you'll hear about these if you read on Indigenous history. But for right now, in Indigenous health, you just need to know that, yes, we had our own governments, we had our own uh, laws and ways to deal with each other, uh, and we certainly had structures in place before settlers got here and continued to have them for quite some time after settlers. However, the settlers came and they brought foreign institutions and structures. And we're going to talk a, a bit about these three here. Uh, you will have a second lecture on history and it'll take you from the 1960s to, to more current day. Uh, and then uh, you'll have some more after that. But these three documents in particular have tremendous impact on Indigenous people in Canada uh, and technically even into the States, if you look at the Royal Proclamation and we talk about a couple other things that happened before the British North America Act. So the Royal Proclamation was declared by King George uh, and he basically said that you couldn't take land without negotiating it between uh, the British monarchy and him. And that that's because before 1763, you'll notice by looking at this map, that the French controlled most of North America or Turtle Island. So if you see the blue sections, that is all France's territory. Ironic, but yes. Uh, <laughs> and there are some areas up in the Hudson's Bay area, which were um, ceded by France to Great Britain, which is actually where the Rupert's Land and the Hudson's Bay Company uh, originate. So they there are areas where the trading and who was up there could be French or British, and it didn't seem to make a big a difference. Uh, Great Britain has the red, which really these weren't, they were British people, but they really wanted to get away from being under the monarchy. And you know them as the United States, but right at this point, they are the 13 colonies of the uh, Americas, which will join and become the United States in 1773, but aren't there yet. And then the orange is where the Spaniards had come and taken over territory. So if you take a look at that map, um, 
you'll notice that that's a lot of places where we have Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee peoples. So the, you know, the Ojibwe, the Algonquin, the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, the Seneca, the Oneida, the Cayuga. Uh, and if you go into the United States, I find that there's more of the indigenous names for things still down there, whereas it's not up here. And so when I say that, um, you know, a lot of these, the space is uh, taken over by uh, what becomes British people uh, as we get through the next little bit. So the Royal Proclamation says that Indigenous people are sovereign people. Uh, and that's what is at the backbone of some of the great court cases in Canada and the United States right now, because we were considered sovereign by the monarch before the countries were born. And therefore, we should still be sovereign at this point. But as you'll see, that's not the case. So the War of 1812 happens, uh, and uh, Lieutenant Brock, Lieutenant General Brock, uh, who we have a university named after here in Ontario, uh, gets to be friends with um, a um, warrior named Tecumseh. Uh, and he promises Tecumseh that if we, we uh, Canada, wins the war or, or the British win the war, that red section on the map, would, which is the Ohio River Valley, would become Indian territory, meaning that both the uh, British and the Americans would give up that territory in order to allow the Indians to have their own territory in the middle. And there was other places that they were willing to give, but that was the mainstay of what the war was about. So the First Nations burned down the White House <laughs> in this war. Uh, they also keep the Americans from coming in through Detroit because we own Detroit. Canada owned Detroit at that point. So Fort Detroit was the outmo outermost post in that war. And they kept the Americans from coming in there and kept them at bay in New York as well. So coming out of Fort York. And so with that, it sounds all lovely and they figure they're going to win. And it really did look like they would, would win. Uh, but Brock dies in a, a battle and nobody else seems to know about this uh, agreement that was made with Tecumseh. Uh, and Tecumseh dies in war in one of the final battles and doesn't make it out of the, the war. And so this whole plan of getting us an Indian territory dies on the battlefield. And in fact, the war never really gets won. It's signed away in a treaty. Uh, and so if you read up on the Jay Treaty and the, uh, the Treaty of Paris, you'll find out how we get our, our territories and such in Canada and the U.S. But uh, again, not about Indigenous history, just to say that we were promised land that was never given. And now we're still fighting for land that we need. So by 1857... Uh, obviously, we have more and more settlers in Canada, and this is starting to shape up into a, an issue for them because uh, in the 1850s, you, if you ever heard of Charles Darwin and his origin of species, uh, you would hear that that was a way that people in England started to think about other human beings, not just, uh, you know, different animals. They thought that there must be some kind of hierarchy in terms of who was at the top and who was at the bottom. In their opinion, obviously, British people were at the top and at the bottom were Indian people or First Nations people, then black people, uh, then brown people uh, from India when they figured out that they hadn't made India here. And so part of what they did was start to go, OK, well, how can we stop this? Like we don't want First Nations people in our in our colony. And so they came up with something called the Gradual Enfranchisement Act in 1857. So this is before we have our country. And this is where the terminology Indian actually goes into our legislation. It's not really embedded in the Indian Act. It actually reverts back to this definition. And it's really not very clear either. So it says the term Indian uh, in the following enactment shall mean any person to whom under the foregoing provisions, the third section of the act therein cited shall continue to apply. And the term enfranchised Indian shall mean any person to whom the said section would have been applicable, but for the operation of the provisions herein after made in the in that behalf and that the term tribe shall include any band or other recognized community of Indians. In other words, if you were considered an Indian, 
Uh, and if you look back at census data from the 1800s, and I think even back into the late 1700s when they were collecting data, when the Indian agents would go out, if you were on the land and you didn't get put on the Indian rolls, then you weren't considered an Indian, which has an effect all the way to today. And when we talk about the Indian Act, uh, I will mention that again. But uh, that the other thing was if they thought that you could speak enough English or you owned enough land or you had um, you showed signs of being more British, then you lost your Indian status just by sheer enfranchisement. And uh, on the books, officially, only one person voluntarily enfranchised, but uh, I'm sure there were many more that were forced into enfranchisement. So before uh, we get too far, you'll find out that the Indian Act also stops a lot of things. So that definition of who's an Indian is important when we start talking about what isn't allowed under the Indian Act. So then we get to the British North America Act, which some people call the Constitution Act, but it's it's not. They're two different things. Uh, this is enacted in 1867. And what it really does is it creates this jurisdictional divide that we still have today. So provinces are responsible for education and health and social services. And the federal government is responsible for some key people. So they're responsible for RCMP, military, uh, Im immigrants and refugees, people in federal prisons, and last but not least, First Nations people, Métis and Inuit. And so those groupings all fall under them, even though the provinces are responsible for the health and education, uh, because of that jurisdictional quagmire that's created with the BNA, which has never been fixed, by the way, uh, it still continues to exist, which means that First Nations people, Métis people, and Inuit people often have to fight with the government to get what they need. So that means essentially that they're uh, working towards, you know, trying to improve this, but it it hasn't happened in more than 150 years, and I'm not sure it can. So how many numbered treaties do we have? And I think this is an important thing. We do have um, more than, uh, you know, 100 treaties in Canada, uh, but the numbered treaties are the ones that most people know. And I like this little uh, cartoon, let's celebrate Columbus Day by walking into someone's house and telling them we live there now. Ironically, just last week, Doug Ford said, uh, talking about the Caledon protesters, that uh, people can't just take over other people's future homes. And so I actually think this is kind of funny and ironic at the same time, because Doug Ford thinks that First Nations people can't keep get back to a treaty right that they were given, by the way, that all of that territory, uh, six miles on either side of the Grand River, all the way up past Kitchener-Waterloo and all the way down is actually supposed to be Mohawk territory. So, um, you know, yeah, a whole other ball of wax, right? So here are the, the, the different uh, treaties. And the ones you need to know about are, are treaties 1 to 11. So there's 11 numbered treaties in Canada. Uh, if you take a look over in BC, while well, there's a whole bunch of weird little squiggles and, and such, these are land claims for the most part. There is not a lot of uh, treaties that have been signed there. There's been a few modern day treaties uh, like NISCA. And um, there's more being developed, but not finished because they don't want to give up their constitutional right to being Indigenous peoples. And that's what the government's trying to do with all modern treaties is make you give up your your entitlement as an Indigenous person to just be a Canadian for them to give you back land. So treaties 1 to, to 11 uh, are situated in Alberta, a little bit into British Columbia and the Northwest Territories, but primarily it's the West. And then you'll see that Treaty 11 is way up here too. Uh, and so Treaty 6, which is this big guy right here between Alberta and Saskatchewan, is the one we're going to talk about because it's the one that actually lists health and education in it. Treaty 8, which is signed up here just shortly after it, uh, also has something about health and education, but it's not as clear cut as Treaty 6. So Treaty 6 actually has a, a clause in it. It's called the Medicine Chest Clause. And it says, in the event hereafter of the Indians can promise within this treaty being overtaken by pestilence or by any general famine, the Queen will grant the Indians assistance necessary and sufficient to relieve them from the calamity that shall have befallen them, and that a medicine chest shall be kept at the house of each Indian agent for such use and benefit of the Indians at the direction of such agent. 
So why is this important? Well, this is the underlying, underpinning statement in terms of Indigenous health today. Without this statement, nothing that Indigenous people get today would be even remotely possible because none of the other treaties list anything like this. Now, the argument on the federal government side is only those in Treaty 6 should be entitled to all of these benefits, but under their benevolence, they decide to give treaty, uh, the medicine chest and the medicine chest clause to every, every First Nation in Canada. Um, however, with that being said, Dreaver uh, in BC went to court against the monarch in 1935, and the court interpreted medicine chest to include supplies of everything, mental, uh, medical and dental. And so that meant that everything was free. That's how we get non-insured health benefits. And that's why prescriptions are free. And before we had uh, universal health care, all of the uh, cost to go to a physician or a dentist was paid because of that clause in that, that court case. Now, uh, a medicine chest in 1877 uh, is not the same as a medicine chest in 2020. And so the argument is, what did they actually mean in this? And no judge up to this point has wanted to actually clearly delineate what that is. Uh, there's other court cases that have gone on um, to make sure that we can have transportation to medical supply uh, to medical personnel and supplies. Um, there's Jordan's principle, which we'll get into at another point through this course. But all of these things happen because of Treaty Six. So now I want to give you a chance to take a look at the past system and. Forgive me, this is my first time trying to do a, a, a click about, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to try to play the video if I can. About little stories. In Cree, we say Atmunsa. The little stories that contribute to the big, big story. You couldn't leave the reserve unless you had a pass from the Indian agent. It never was embodied in law. It was not part of the Indian Act. The idea was in the air before 1885. This effort to introduce a measure to restrict people to their reserves applied to all First Nations on reserves in Western Canada. The pass and permit system is tied to that form of racialization that we've inherited. Poor called those damn Indians. They had to get a permit to go to our neighboring friends, relatives. I had to carry that around on my body. Indian agent was in their face almost every day. They send you to jail. We seem to be quite happy to go on marginalizing these people and condemning them to slow down. It's not the way we treat other Canadians. They want to control our land. They want to control our resources. They want to control our people. And they want to do it in a nice way. It's about where we come from, where we are, and where we are going. So after watching that little video, I hope that that kind of gives you a sense of how um, First Nations people uh, were kept on the reserves. This happened for quite some time. Uh, because it was unofficial policy, nobody seems to have a real start and end date that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean that there isn't one, but uh, I've heard lots of First Nations people, even at Six Nations, who are still alive and who talk about the fact that they had to have their pass. So what you're seeing here in the pictures are what the passes look like. Uh, they had to tell them where they were going, how much money they were going to be taking from the reserve, uh, when they were going to be back, who they were, would be going to see. Um, and who would be go like who would be going alongside? So if you had children that you were taking with you, you had to announce all of them. 
And so this is important because uh, no other Canadians are jailed <laughs> up until quarantine. This has never happened, but quarantine is kind of like what the past system was like in the sense that you really weren't supposed to go anywhere, but nobody was policing you. So you could still get out and about, but that wasn't true of the past system. Once you were on the reserve, you couldn't leave it. So that brings us to the Indian Act, and I, I can't go through the entire Indian Act. I used to teach an entire course on that for 12 weeks, so there's so much content there that uh, we're not possibly going to get through it all. But what I do want to note is the Indian Act uh, is the next piece of legislation after the British North America Act, and it comes into uh, in, uh, legislation in 1876. Um, so 67 for the BNA and 76 for the Indian Act. So nine years after the, the country is formed, they create the Indian Act. And this is essentially ways to keep uh, First Nations people separate, but also to make sure that they can't keep their culture. So the cultural genocide really starts with the Indian Act. And as you can see on the left hand side, Duncan Campbell Scott, who's the deputy superintendent it, Superintendent General uh, says that he wants to get rid of every the Indian problem. Our object is to continue until there's not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and that there is no Indian question and no Indian department, which is essentially what I'm seeing happen and has been happening most of my life. Uh, but right now, uh, we're hearing more and more of this. Every modern treaty is saying that you won't be considered an Indian or a First Nations person anymore. Uh, in order for you to get the rights that you're asking for. So this is really important. The Indian Act also uh, determines who's status and not status. And I talked a little bit earlier about the fact that if you were on the trail or they determined that you were British enough, uh, you didn't get put on the rolls, which then has implications for your uh, future ancestors, right? So the future generations. So if you weren't on the rolls at the beginning, then your uh, children and their children and so on and so forth can't get registered uh, and it makes it harder and harder. So depending on where you were when registration happened, this really becomes problematic. And I know that there's been quite a few people, at least in, in the northern parts where they do live on the, the hunting and trapping lines, that they weren't registered in the beginning and therefore their families weren't registered. So you'll have people who really should be able to register and can't. Plus, the Indian Act also said that if you were an Indigenous woman, a First Nations woman, and you married a non-First Nations man uh, prior to 1951, you lost your status. But if you were a First Nations man and you married a non-First Nations woman, she gained status. And there's a whole thing between what we call a 6-1 and a 6-2 Indian, uh, which we'll talk about in, in future uh, discussions. But really, this really has a, a gender discrimination in it. And they're still trying to address it uh, through legislation and the way they make changes and amendments to the Indian Act. So the Indian Act also says that you're not allowed to traditionally belong. Uh, and when I say that, we had, as I said, we had governance structures. And usually you were attached to your First Nation through the mother's side of the family uh, for most First Nations, not all, but most. And so that's not true of the patriarchy and the way that they created the act itself. And because our country is, is built on patriarchy, uh, often they don't want to see matrilineal um, succession, if you will. And they changed all of our governance structures. Over time, they brought in band councils, which are not our elected. They're elected through a governance government kind of system, just like we do municipalities or or provincial or federal uh, MPs and MPPs. Um, but it's not the way that we would traditionally have put people in structures. So for example, in Six Nations, uh, they use the longhouse. Everybody from the clans have uh, clan mothers or clan grandmothers who sit on a council and decide who's going to govern. Uh, and when you start to talk to uh, some of the Anishinaabe people, like in the Algonquin Territory, there was usually hereditary chiefs, and then there were chiefs who did different kinds of negotiations. And they, those were instilled uh, by the community members, not by an, a voting system, but rather based on your natural gifts and the way that you were raised and the opportunities afforded to you, you would be in a position of, uh, I guess, leadership, if you will. So the amendments to the Indian Act happen right almost from the get-go. Um, the One of the first is in 1880, and it still exists today on the books in 2020, uh, 
that uh, First Nations communities cannot sell or barter uh, any kind of agricultural produce. So if they have a farm, they can't sell that and they can't make money. So this is the kind of thing that is a long-term trauma that has huge impacts over time. Uh, they're pro for a long period of time, 1885 until well into the uh, 1930s, I think, uh, you'll see that they don't get to do any kinds of ceremonies. So the ceremonies go underground, which means you lose a little bit of them because they can't be performed in the way that they're intended. And this was really intended to get rid of the potlatch ceremony, which is a way of giving all of your worldly possessions away. So people that were considered wealthy in First Nations communities, specifically out west and in BC, uh, were would have a potlatch and give away their their possessions as a way of showing kindness to the community and to not accumulate any kind of wealth because that's not why we're here in this world. Uh, you'll notice there are a number of other um, amendments that happened between uh, the 1880 amendment and 1918. And then we get into uh, the banning of our traditional governance in 1920. Uh, they also decided that bet between 1912, no, 1911 and uh, 1950, that if you decided to go to war for Canada, so you went to World War One or Two as a soldier for Canada, you had to give up an enfranchise and you gave up your status as a First Nations person, thereby not being able to go back to your reserve after the war uh, and often didn't get the same kind of benefits that other veterans did. Uh, if you went to post-secondary schools, so universities or colleges, which doesn't really seem to happen until the 1950s and 60s, uh, we do have other people that have gone before that, but the the, the first influx, I guess, is in the 19 between the 1940s and the 1950s, and they had to give up their status in order to go to post-secondary and become a doctor, a nurse, or a teacher. Um, the other way is, like I was saying, if you married out, you lost status. So it was really important uh, to know this. And in 1927, they said we couldn't have lawyers, and that doesn't get given back until the 1960s. So we're talking 40 years. That's like a generation of people that couldn't go and get a lawyer to help them to make any claims against the government. Now, in 1951, this is a huge amount of amendments, and one of them is ceremonies can come back. Uh, they can now go back to having uh, land claims, but that it didn't necessarily say you could have a lawyer, uh, but they could have land claims. Uh, women could vote in banned elections, but not federal or provincial elections. That doesn't happen until between 1960 and 1969, depending on which province you're from. And they finally end uh, the idea of compulsory enfranchisement in 1961. So it takes till, uh, uh, from where, as an Algonquin person, my mom didn't get the right to vote till 1969 because she was in Quebec. And so, you know, we're not talking a long, long time ago. We're talking, you know, within uh, a 50-year span that we've uh, just gotten the right to vote. So that's not really a long time to try to, to, to make change. Um, in 1985 is the next big amendment, and it's Bill C-31. You'll hear that a lot. Uh, if you're starting to look at Indigenous history, because this is when they tried to start to eradicate the gender discrimination in terms of who could register and who couldn't. So they started to uh, give back status to women who had married non-Indigenous people uh, and their children. And that seemed great, but that didn't cover everybody. And so uh, it takes until 2010 and Bill C-3 comes in and it's supposed to rectify it. And it still doesn't quite. And so there's been some changes uh, in the last five, six years uh, that also try to rectify that. And now this whole idea in 2000 of having members that live off reserve uh, being able to vote in banned elections is not altruistic. It was the federal government's way to get some of the uh, treaty signed that they needed. So for example, in uh, Golden Lake and, um, and the Algonquins in Ontario and Quebec, they didn't have enough people who were interested in signing the treaty for Ottawa. And so they started to allow band members that weren't on reserve to vote in the band elections and then also vote on any kind of resolutions that were happening at the band level in order to try to pass this treaty. A little underhanded in my opinion. So we'll talk more about uh, all of these issues in a coming video.